As we roll into September and the new school year in North America, we're shifting gears at the Future Tourism Podcast. Over the past six months, a lot has happened. In March, we faced our first global pandemic. It ground literally everything to a halt as the first wave roared across the globe, creating a devastating health crisis. By late spring, the tourism industry was at a standstill, and industry leaders around the world were coming to terms with the fact that this crisis was not going to go away, and that our lives and our world would be ever changed in the aftermath. Over the past six months, I had the great honor and privilege of interviewing 20 industry leaders from across the spectrum. DMO CEOs, research specialists, product development consultants, HR specialists, and marketing leaders from around the world. All of them stressed the need to reimagine and reinvent the destination management organization and do it in a way that engages stakeholders and citizens alike to create sustainable local industries that can thrive and prosper in the ever-changed world. Of course, as destination organizations, we still have the key role and function of marketing and popularizing our destinations, but in a world of scarce and impaired resources, that's no longer enough. We have to create partnerships. We have to be perceived as creating partnerships, and those partnerships have to deliver tangible, measured, and repeatable results. In September 2020, it is fair to say that in some sense, we all now face the same problems at the same time a need to integrate better with our local citizens, stakeholders, and partners, and a need to develop strategies that are shared and valued in our communities. It's time to talk about the tools and resources that we will need to embrace and perhaps even invent as we reimagine, rebuild, and future-proof our destinations. My guest today is Amir Elon, CEO of Longwoods International. Back in May on the podcast, he said to me, Every DMO needs to stop thinking about where they've been and find the clarity to figure out where they go next. Today, we're going to talk about where next is and what are the resources that we can employ to get there. Good morning, Amir. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. I'm I'm really glad to have you back. I can't have you back and and not ask you about the latest um, U.S. uh, travel intentions uh, data. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, f- favorite flavor of the day these days. Um, well, uh, you know, the most recent wave, uh, and oh my gosh, we've already gotten uh, 18 waves and the 19th wave comes out of the field today, believe it or not. But, uh, you know, we've seen stabilization on, on, on uh, some of the key indicators that had been trending downwards in July due to the, uh, um, you know, the surge in, in cases and some destinations pausing and rolling back even some of the reopening phases. Uh, August, it seems to kind of stabilize and that's been good. And looking as we head into September, uh, the data is really uh, showing stabilization. A lot of areas were showing um, the continued very strong pent up demand. We are showing uh, that there is uh, that shift in the traveler mindset has happened uh, already, happened about mid-July, uh, that shifting from waiting out the pandemic to how do I travel within the confines of the pandemic? How much risk am I willing to accept and go out? And while, you know, 40, you know, you know uh, only 40% of American travelers tell us that uh, they feel comfortable traveling outside their community, a greater number than that actually are traveling outside the communities out there. The road trip travel uh, continues to dominate uh, and, and, and so forth. I think over the last few weeks, what we've been really looking at, though, are what are the causes of hesitancy? What are the concerns about safety? Uh, we've dug more into that. And, you know, the most recent wave of research that we did on the subject, um, you know, we really asked, you know, what, what, what's causing you to hesitate? And we saw it's confusion, lack of clarity and confusion. Uh, I'm glad you opened up that line about clarity because because there's so much contradicting inform- information and it's and a lot of the information, quite frankly, is changing. You know, as as the pandemic evolves, uh, so the the traveler is confused on what they are, what 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 what's they are they have to ex- expect. Uh, what what are the rules as I go to for a certain destination? Do the rules change from destination to destination as I take a road trip, for example, um, in there? And and we're seeing almost half of the traveling public telling us. Uh, that 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 lack of clarity is keeping them from from traveling. And, so you you talked about the consumer adapting to the pandemic. You know, mm-hmm. you, the, you previously it was what's my intention to travel, and then it was is it safe to travel? And it's like now, how can I travel? How can exactly. I adapt? 
in some senses, organizations, destination organizations, we've gone through the same curve. In the middle of it, it was, gee, I don't know, what do we need to do next? How do we figure it out? Now we're at the point where we're saying, this is here, we need to adapt. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, this is the moment for, for destination organizations to shine, right? Because they can be the clear conduit of information. Um, you know, many of them have already been doing that. They pivoted right away, you know, information where to find food and where to, you know, to buy food, to go shop locally and things like that. N now it's about making sure that through all their communication channels, all their staff, et cetera, everybody's on the same page. Or what are the rules of engagement into my community? What are the expectations of the travel in my destination? What can the traveler expect while in the destination? And that, that is so clear. You know, one, one, one statistic I'll throw at you that really alarmed us um, on this last wave of travel is that one in four American travelers told us they're not sure if they'll be welcome in the destination they're interested in visiting. Think about that. One in four aren't even sure. So who's to, who's to convey the message that, that they will be welcome? Well, and, uh, you know, as we come out of this, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear. And, and one of the things that always um, rings home is the DMO has a, a really well-established role in marketing and popularizing it doesn't have nearly as well an established role as a as a community and stakeholder galvanizing kind of leader and and i don't mean that with to cast any aspersions but i think in the industry we look across the board and say in this crisis we all woke up and realized we could have been better aligned locally and, and i mean we've all been through the last six months we we've all heard some of the proclamations i i don't want to keep pounding the drum but you know you said the same thing we need to we need to help now we need to work with our local destinations jack johnson's um constant reminder that we need to change and change quickly to become relevant all of those things come home to roost in there is stakeholder engagement there are tools that I'm seeing DMOs employ for stakeholder engagement and stakeholder alignment. Let's let's tackle one of the more esoteric things, though, mm -hmm. because it's one thing to get on to stakeholder engagement. Most DMOs have been doing some form of it, and now they're learning to amplify that, um, um, stratify that, add resources to it, and increase that. And, and they can show good return there. But what about something like resident sentiment? How, first of all, talk to us about what it is, and then let's talk about how a DMO that really hasn't, you know, uh, thoroughly embraced resident sentiment gets on the on-ramp on that one. Well, you know, you mentioned our good friend Jack Johnson over at Destinations International. And last year, you and I were both sitting in the room at the annual convention in St. Louis where he gave his keynote address and said the number one most important customer in a destination is the resident. That turned a lot of heads. Um, we we We've done that you know, selfishly long was we've known that for, for a couple of years now because we've been tracking resident sentiment. Uh, you know what what we've um, you know for 43 years now we've been conducting research on the traveler. We've been talking to travelers um, and, and we can tell our clients everything about their travelers and, and, and what makes them tick and so forth. But when the issues of over tourism and other uh, sustainability and tourism, the environment, all these issues started boiling up in recent years, uh, not just internationally, but here in US soil, uh, especially, um, and, and, and the media started taking hold, our phones started ringing off the hook a couple of years ago and said, and folks saying, um, help, how do we deal with this? And we said, well, it's not about getting data on the traveler, then it's about talking to the resident. So what we did was we, you know, we just shifted our methodology in terms of image research and so forth and 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 turned it in and, and turned it around on the resident. So for so two years ago, uh, well, actually almost two and a half years ago, we we uh, did the first ever uh, in, in partnership with our good friends at Destinations International, did the first ever national benchmark of resident sentiment research, uh, where we did a cross section of Americans and we, and and, uh, uh, and asked them a whole battery of questions on a series of categories, everything from tourism and the economy, tourism and the environment, uh, the over tourism issues, tourism and quality of life. Uh, dest destination mark their 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 sentiment towards destination marketing organizations, etc. Um, and a whole about eight different buckets uh, there. Uh, we actually literally just last week uh, came out of the field with our third uh, annual report on this, and we've greatly increased the sample this year so we can get some more regional and generational data. So this fall, if you're uh, looking at the De Destination International Advocacy Summit, stay tuned for uh, 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 some some good detail on that. 
sorry, is that a member a benefit page? The, the the study? Can we go and look um, at the yeah, There's books? a white paper on the, on the Destinations International website and also on the longwithinternational.com. There, there's a, you can download the white paper summaries of, of those and we'll have an updated uh, white paper, obviously, in time for the release. Super. Uh, we'll, we'll attach the link to the blog post too yeah. so that people can find it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah great. So, and, and this year, of course, we've also added modules on uh, sentiment towards travel during pandemic, uh, as we obviously we've been capturing a lot of that sentiment during our tra tracker studies, as, as, as you know, um, and also sentiment towards sports travel. Uh, so, so there's going to be some uh, some additional uh, areas there. But you know, you know, the, the, it's but at the end of the day, this is going to be this is an emerging KPI that the pandemic just accelerated its rise to the forefront. So you've got a, um, a comparative set now, a national benchmark that you've executed. This will be the third time. Let's 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 hypothetically become a DMO mm -hmm. in in Middle America. Let's do that for a moment. Um, you know the 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 average budget of a of a US DMO is somewhere a little bit north of three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. Sixty percent of them live under ten million dollars in yep. terms of budgets. So here I am. I've got a successful DMO. I've got a good, solid brand. It's unique. I market it, um, you know, locally, uh, and then out from there, I probably see, you know, sixty percent of my my traveling public comes from within within fifty or hundred miles, and the rest of it I, I work harder for. I've never done resident sentiment. How do I get started? Oh, easy. Uh, obviously, we uh, so in partnership with Destinations International, we recognized after we did a couple rounds of the national benchmark. Uh, the methodology is solid. It's now time to make it available, and because there are there is comparative benchmarks now, make it available to individual destinations. So we rolled it out about a little over a year ago. Um, the um, we can do a similar study. The questionnaire, for the most part, mimics the national questionnaire, but there's a customizable data for you know because every destination is different. Everybody's got their own issues, and you might want to get to the bottom of certain things or take temperature on certain things that, that, that are local. We've done this, uh, gosh, about a dozen and a half times in the past year already for, for various destinations. Um, and you, you talk about budgets, it is a very small investment to take a pulse check on there. Uh, I'm talking about four to very low five digits, uh, um, uh, again, depending on what you're trying to try, trying to attack. To, so, so for, again, if your budget's $3 million, you know, is it not worth, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars to figure out what's uh, what, what what what's going on in your backyard? So you know me, Elon. Um, I'm particularly focused on usable uh, research. So yep. give us some sort of case relative uh, insight into usable. So we do resident sentiment survey, and not, nothing drives me crazier than than research that sits in a drawer, especially oh, yeah. good research. So how how is it applied? what kind of shifts take place and i mean shifts require resources the dmo um but if we're going to get this done we've got to identify those things and get over those hurdles so yeah. talk about implementation yeah. once the research is yeah. done I'll I'll, I'll 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 do this without violating some client confidentiality because some of these studies are very recent and i know the clients in the middle of applying these uh in, in there but um you know uh we, we can get into some of the key tr trends and findings that we've seen over uh, have been common threads throughout these things in a moment but but um we've basically seen a few key buckets of clients of how they want to apply and use the data that we presented them uh, based on resident sentiment um there's the most basic way which is we have we've had a few clients whose primary resource and the way they're applying this is this is the ammo to have in their toolbox so if that reporter calls and says, "Hey, I hear we've got a, uh, I hear we've got an over tourism problem, or, or, or you know, tourism is just really uh, all this tourism development is just just causing havoc in the community or whatever." Um, that DMO then you know, they've got the, you know their, their, their communication staff have they pull it out and say, "Well, matter of fact, that's the most basic way, and that's fine." But the ones that are the clients that are being the most innovative with it, or, or, or I think I think are really taking it and applying it uh, in, in the apply format. Um, we have one client that was um, that actually did it with a bunch of regional partners, and they did a regional uh, look that there was the core of the destination, but they also looked at surrounding counties, surrounding areas, um, and it was to build. A regional awareness of the resident sentiment to see the difference between the core and, and the outer bur burbs and and is and was using that at the time uh, to build kind of a more unified vision 
of tourism development in there and actually uh, use that as, as part of the, um, uh, the, case build, the case building for the coalition to go after and secure a dedicated funding source. So, uh, and, 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 and part of the commitment is that, you know, this is the easiest way to say, hey, we've got stakeholder involvement here in, 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 in the strategy. So, and, so I, those two examples are great. And I, I know you want to keep going, but how do you market it back to the community? You must, you must be seeing work there where DMOs are yeah. stepping up and they're using that sentiment to effectively, as Jack would say, yeah. change their lexicon, but also... I'm a marketer at heart, and the bottom line is if you want to build consensus, you market internally just as hard as you market externally. Where do you see that happening? So that's the third bucket, actually. So we have this third bucket of clients uh, that actually uh, are taking this data and they're building their engagement strategy for the community. And there are a couple of them that were just uh, just foundationally building it up and ready to roll it out. And you know what, pandemic actually accelerated it, I think in, in a certain ways because they turned all their organizational marketing inwards into the community. But 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 really the game, the plan of attack was, boy, we, we, we took these learnings and we realized we're missing whole stakeholder groups. We are missing whole education uh, opportunities in here because as DMOs, what have we done very well traditionally? Well, our legislative stakeholders are informed. Uh, those who control the money bags, uh, the city council, the county commissioner, uh, you know, maybe local economic development agencies, you know, stakeholders, they're, they're informed. Uh, community engagement is typically defined as uh, speaking at the Kiwanis or the Lions Club breakfast, uh, rotary lunch once a month or once a year and, uh, and, and so forth. But who was at the school board meetings? You know, right, who was right. who, who's gathering at the church groups or, or community town halls? Who, who, who you know, who, when, when's the last time they held community town halls? Just to say, here's what we're doing. Well, so when, when we speak to our civic partners, we use a jargon or a lexicon specific to them. We talk about economic development. We talk about city taxes and residents, you know, quality of life and, and return on their tax investment. When we when we talk to our um, stakeholder partners, we talk about marketing them and pushing their brand aside. What's 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 apparent to me in all of that is when you want to engage somebody, you must learn their language and speak to them. And I think right. that's at the core of what Jack's been saying. Right. So the resident doesn't hear themselves in the city <laughs> speak, and the right. resident doesn't necessarily hear themselves in the marketing speak. But when you speak directly to them and you identify that these are issues they brought forward. These are issues that they can that they can um, count on the destination organization to rally behind on their behalf. That's got to resonate, and it does, right? Because it, 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 you're, you're spot on. It's it's about finding the right language and connecting yourself to the hot button issue for that resident. So if at you know at, at the community town hall, the issues about you know the issue might be about homelessness. Well, guess what? They're, they're, they're part a successful tourism economy can help tackle the issue of tone. We're part of the solution for homelessness uh, in, in terms of uh, education, you know, funding, school funding issues and so forth. Well, again, uh, it's a healthy tourism economy is part of that solution for education, educational development and so forth. There are so many, um, you know, you know, you know I, I, I have yet to be stumped. Uh, a few colleagues and I were sitting pre-COVID in, in a bar one night in a hotel bars we are apt to do after, uh, after a good day of dialogue. And, 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 and we were literally kicking out every community issue that we could on the table about there. And we were able to directly tie a, 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 a healthy uh, and strong vitality within the, tourism, within the tourism, local tourism industry to being part of the solution. For whatever that issue was you were throwing at us and 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 it was amazing i think we tackled like 20 issues where tourism was part of the solution and and it's really finding that language and connecting with 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 that group yeah tourism isn't all things to everyone but we know the benefits to the community and we just have to use the language to that, that relates to you which is, might be different to how it relates to me or to him or etc so so let's talk about some of the roadblocks that maybe stop resident sentiment become from becoming a mainstream a applied research piece but a kpi because those are the things we've got to surmount i mean the first one is it's not on my chart of accounts i don't have a budget right. for this right so you know that one i wanted to spell myself and say hey this is a com combination between research marketing and product development it's all of those things we take it from all three of those buckets when we do research like this in the regional tourism office yeah. Well, you know, folks never let a good crisis go to waste, right? I mean, we've, how many times have we said that? Right. <laughs> you know, okay. I mean, I mean, right now, 
you know, as, as destination organizations are fighting for their lives in many cases, and they're fighting, they're fighting for the financial side uh, uh, backing. And, and as we know, as we head into 2021, there's going to be, because state and local coffers are, are turning up short in very, very dramatic ways, uh, there's going to be a lot of competing, more, even more competing interests for those limited resources for marketing dollars, et cetera. So, um, so having the community behind you, having the having stakeholder groups behind you, and identify and recognize that you are part of that shared community value that that you're bringing in more than the expenditure going out. Uh, in, in, in so in so many different tangible ways, it's not just you know uh, again DI is right. It's not just a simple statistic anymore. It, it is about uh, you know, it, you know it, 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 it's about the language that's used. It's about it, it, it's about demonstrating the connection through the connectivity throughout the community. And, and so um, uh, you know it, it, it's it's you, you can't afford not to be taking pulse checks. Uh, there and, and and you can do it scientifically. You can do it informally. It doesn't have to. You know, you you, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to do this. Um, but 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 you do want to be able to compare yourself at the end of the day. So so let's assume we get over the argument that a it's not in my chart of accounts and yeah. and we and to add to that a point you made earlier, this is not an expensive program, and yeah. you will find that most of the research we should be doing by comparison to the dollars we previously spent in marketing. Is, is actually quite reasonable. And I think Amir, you said it most, I, I rarely see research pieces that top the mid five figures. I mean, right. they can be higher for bigger organizations, but these are accessible things with immediate value. So on to, on to objection number two, we're going to get a lot of negative sentiment. Hmm. Um, you know, obviously sentiment varies from community to community. Everybody's got local issues. I will tell you that all the studies we've done some, so far, the favorables generally outweigh the unfavorables. Um, for most of the destinations we've worked with, even the touchiest issues um, that have been there, if there was some negative sentiment, it was not overwhelming. It was not a majority. It was, you know, it, it may have had some significance. But for, for, for the most part, what we found so far is that generally speaking, uh, American residents, and it's pretty well balanced across the country. Now, granted, we know we have certain areas like, you know, uh, maybe in Moab, Utah, or Asheville, North Carolina, or other places like that, where, um, you know, th there, there were very pinpoint, you know, concerns around over-tourism and things like that. But for the most part, um, American residents recognize that, you know, that, that tourism does provide, uh, a, a, you know, additional help for quality of life. They are generally agreeable that uh, it does, uh, that, 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 uh, um, uh, the tourism does bring better assets into their uh, into, into into their communities. Uh, you know, better park systems and, uh, and more things to do and things like that. They also understand that this needs to be marketed, and they have a pride and sense of place. So they actually like the notion that somebody's out there telling the world about what a great place this is to visit. Uh, there, where where they're frustrated, and this is the common this is a common thread here. Where they're frustrated is that the American residents have told us time and time again, it doesn't matter what destination we've looked at, large, small, you know, East Coast, West Coast, Utah, you name it. Um, there, they always feel, they tell us that they feel uninformed about the plans for right. tourism development. The first time they hear about a project, they tell us is when they read about it in the paper, you know, and that and that's frustrating to them. Well, and the other thing that that you know, personal experience takes me to is the negative sentiment is the canary in the mine shaft. Yeah. Doesn't always mean doesn't always mean there's a gas leak, but it does mean pay attention. He, 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 well, here, honestly, more than negative sentiment, here's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is neutral sentiment. Uh, is a neutral, and we've seen this on so many of the key issues on resident sentiment. Is for again, doesn't matter the destination. There's a big middle section that's neutral, or tells us, you know what, I just didn't even know about this issue enough to to give an opinion. On it. Sounds like the party system in politics in Canada right. and the U.S. <laughs> there you go, exactly, exactly. But think about that. If you have an issue, if you have an issue and the sentiment has 45% favorable, maybe 10% against, but the rest are all neutral, well, what happens? Things go south the wrong way and all the neutrals jump into the against or are significant important. Now you've got a problem. You know, and, and so, 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 so don't look at how, how, I mean, favorables are important in political polling, you know, they always look at their favorables in there, uh, are there, but look at the neutrals and the neutral and, and, and the neutrals, the fact that we have on so many key issues, significant amounts of neutrals tells us again, that we've just failed as an industry to really educate 
our communities. And, 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 and but, but that great biggest challenge is also our biggest opportunity. And again, this crisis has has brought that opportunity right front and center. So, and I'm, I'll, I'll sum it up here. I really like that point that letting the massive neutrals sit inert is a wasted opportunity. And we really, we really can make them part of this. And we also, you know, we've said many, many times before across you and I, across the table with other people, the best destinations are, are engaged stakeholders in part because it mitigates that neutrality yeah. for sure. You've talked about this being a cost-effective tool for most destinations. Um, it's also not a time-prohibitive tool. I mean, you can you can set up, execute, and then start to use the learnings very quickly, can't you? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, the methodology we employ, for example, uh, you know, ten weeks, you know, two and a half months, you can get from there. You can even do it faster. There are ways to accelerate that um, in there. But but even but even if you go through more informal channels, um, you know. You can get pulse checks done on a smaller scale, you know, very, very quickly and, and, and begin and begin learning from it. Well, and then then there's something, you know, you I won't borrow the word halo effect because that's a, a Longwood registered thing. But let's call it the Hawthorne effect in, okay. in, in, in the business case model, which is when you pay something, pay attention to something, it changes. So I also, you know, uh, just as we close out here, would say the instance of engaging your community and in input has a Hawthorne effect. By paying attention to it, it starts a dialogue that that their input's important. You must have seen that in on many occasions. Uh, absolutely, and and those communities that engage, when you ask that question about how, what what what's what's the perception of that shared community good, shared community value of the industry, if those those communities that have been engaging the residents successfully, tourism is always higher on the chart in, in, in there. You know, uh, we may never be as important as the fire and police services, obviously, because that's life or death. But 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 right now, nationally, we're in the bottom third and and, and the communities that are doing well can at least show up in the top half, top third, uh, et cetera. There's a lot of room to grow. I, I don't think there's a. Uh, you know, uh, there's some communities that are doing it well, but nobody's doing it perfectly yet, and 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 uh, or as close to perfectly as possible yet. Uh, and 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 we're going to be learning very very quickly over the next few years. Well, and and we do. We need to invent some tools as we go. But right now, there are tools on the shelf like resident sentiment that we can implement that you have you know educated us about that said it's not prohibitively expensive. It's not difficult to implement. It does need to be integrated into your go forward strategy to have value, but it's there and it's ready. Um, thanks for being here today. It's it's always the greatest pleasure to talk to you. I will say to you, you know, in closing, are there any last points you'd like to to put across? Yeah, you know, I think uh, you know, there's there's so much change coming at us right now, right? There are so many people telling us that KPIs are evolving. There's so many new things. You, you know, Pre-pandemic, we were already struggling with our plates being full as destination marketers uh, uh, there. Um, it's, I think you, everybody just needs to not look at look, look at things like resident sentiment or whatever other new KPI you're looking at as, oh gosh, one more thing to worry about. I think you look at it as, what am I going to worry about? And the stuff that doesn't seem to jump on that plate, maybe that's not so important anymore. Don't sweat it, don't sweat the small stuff. All right. Real pleasure. Thanks again. I hope you have a great day and a great weekend. Take care, Amir. Thank you. You too.